I would now like to introduce today's presenters. Rohit Ashwa Agarwal, Vice President, is a leader in Everest Group's sourcing practice. In his role, Rohit Ashwa is focused on engagements and initiatives with global companies that focus on GBS shared services centres. Jimit Arora, partner, leads Everest Group's research offerings focused on enterprise executives in IT, sourcing and vendor management and shared services. Michael Jansen, Chief Research Officer, guides the practice research agenda and architecture by leveraging his extensive experience to identify and unlock emerging trends. Ashwin Vaghatsan, Vice President, is responsible for developing Everest Group's research offerings focused on IT strategy and IT workforce planning and development heads. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Michael. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, as you can see from the, the panel that we have assembled here, we're bringing together a number of different uh, leaders from across the, uh, the Everest Group uh, practices. And, and so we're going to have a multidimensional conversation here as we talk about this. Today, we're really part of a continuing series of uh, follow-on to our 2022 key issues. Uh, there where we look at the macro challenges and look at what uh, your peers and business leaders are concerned about as they enter 2022. And today what we're going to do is we're going to take a very stakeholder specific uh, position and look at the IT stakeholder. And we'll be looking at focusing on how to solve the problem, not just how big the problem is, but how to solve it and drill down from there. So with that, let's get into it. Uh, as you can see on the screen right now, uh, we've listed out the IT uh, business issues, uh, those things that are seen as the most challenging for 2022. And no surprise, if you watch the uh, 2022 key issues, which I believe there's a link in the, uh, in the panel, if you want to go back to the macro uh, on-demand version of the webinar, but you can see here is the IT specific issues. And no surprise, you see I, uh, sourcing and, and talent uh, is at the top of the list. Uh, it's going to be continuing to, to be the number one thing we're going to deal with across all practices, all stakeholders, and across the enterprises in general. Um, distributed IT productivity, obviously, as we, as we continue to uh, think about how we do work, uh, cybersecurity is a, a perennial favorite, uh, as, as that's probably not we're going to go away either. And then uh, you'll see down there for creating the right IT workforce strategy and managing budget. But I think um, 2022 is going to be the year of uh, budget busting year. So, Jamit, that looks almost a flip of what we saw in 2021. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm really intrigued, right? We love doing pattern recognition and this is an exact flip, right? Lateral inverted mirror image of the priorities and not a real surprise because if you think back to how we were entering 2021, uh, there, was a, there was this sense that there was a lot of budget that needed, money that needed to be saved coming off of a not so great year for the industry. 2021 from an economic perspective was really strong uh, most companies did really well. The stock markets did really well. I think the issue that we are now again is looking at from a economy of abundance to an economy of scarcity. And that's where seeing talent, productivity, and workforce as, as three of the top five initiatives for the year uh, is quite appropriate and represents the market reality we're seeing on the ground. Yeah, Jimmy, I think there's a lot of optimism out there. Uh, if you do go back and watch that on-demand version of the, the overall macro issues in the 2022 key issue webinar, you'll see that the demand is up across the board, not just for IT, but for the entirety of the business. So I think there, the number was something like 7.5% increase in the, the total staffing of the firm that was the expectation for 2022. Yep. And that's an incredibly aggressive number given the shortage of talent we have out there right now. So the, 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 two, the two statistics, uh, one of them is not going to work. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to uh, uh, talking about uh, how you see IT uh, in terms of the growth center. I think that's what we've been one of, one of the themes that we've been talking about recently. And, and Michael, going back to what you had in the key issues with that seven and a half percent, I think what we are right now is at the start of a complete mega cycle, right? And and we are seeing investments being put into technology resources being requested at a way at a level that's completely been unprecedented right even going all the way back to the y2k phenomena so this is a mega cycle of demand that we are starting which is expected to last the next five to seven years and why we believe this is different fundamentally is because 
IT organizations are no longer thinking of their world as, hey, we need to create systems of record or systems of engagement or systems of insight. This was the traditional systems thinking. Now it's about truly creating investments and in systems of growth because that's the mindset with which CEOs are approaching the technology groups. And so it's no longer, hey, IT, hey, CIO, be focused on efficiency. No, 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 you have to be my champion for growth. And that's driving a completely different mindset. And that's therefore driving a completely different investment profile. So one of the big implications of moving to the systems of growth thinking is that technology groups are no longer thinking just in terms of applications, but they're thinking about composing big platforms. We no longer think about budgeting decisions. In fact, we're seeing a lot of venture capital style funding and investment decisions coming in, which is why the concept is no longer about, hey, what's the, what's the savings you can generate, but it's more about the return on investment. So the mindset shift is very strong. And IT is not just thinking about ownership of my world, but they're thinking about the orchestration of outcomes, right? And Ashwin, I know you had a couple of examples that you wanted to call, talk through on this. I wanted to bring you in on this conversation as well. Yeah, Javed. And I think the most important aspect that I want to pick on this is the movement towards platform thinking. So we, we are entering a mega cycle where it's about customer hyper segmentation. It's about how you can build micro verticals, it's about my banking experience as an individual. I'm not thinking about my mortgage uh, applications anymore, right? So building those platforms needs cross-functional skills to be brought together, right? It's about applications, infrastructure, data, security, all of, the, all of them being orchestrated together and delivered as a service in the context of the end user who's consuming this. So the technology is there, so the key determinant of, of success in this platform economy is, is not going to be just the investments in, in the technology capital, but the true determinant is going to be the human capital that's there to drive all of this. And this is exactly what we want to dive a bit deeper into the next slide. So we have had a lot of enterprises uh, understandably come and ask us whether this IT talent scramble that we are currently seeing, is this a, a six month phenomenon? Is this a passing cloud? How should we be thinking about it? We fundamentally believe that this is going to be a three to four year cycle that's going to get elongated uh, even further. Uh, we, have some, we have done some aggressive forecasting of, of how the demand supply gap is going to look like for IT roles uh, globally. What we see is the demand supply gap percentage, right? And then what we believe is even after the next three years, if you look at the dotted black line, there's going to be a demand supply gap of around 10%. So what we are saying is that IT functions are going to be perennially understaffed by 10 to 20%, and that's lost value that can be delivered to businesses, right? So that's that's going to be the extent of, of, of challenges that we're going to see in the talent uh, market going ahead. Yeah, Nash, when I, I, I think back to our to our the macro view of this in the 2022 uh, presentation there, and we actually show where the populations of new workers coming into um, the, the arena from uh, both North America and Europe is actually in decline. So the, the available new talent. So I almost like this is too optimistic in terms of actually showing, I think it's, you know, the, the gap's gonna get bigger and bigger. Um, I'm almost having a hard time forecasting it declining uh, or the closing of that gap there. You're right, Michael. So there, there, there are a few elements of hope, obviously, right? So we believe that the way in which uh, IT designs are going to evolve, there's, there's going to be some inherent productivity through automation, through low code, no code, that's going to start kicking in with the maturity uh, of, of, of adoption of these technologies. Uh, uh, you, you talked about US and Europe. We do believe that India still holds the runway in terms of being able to support some of those workforce requirements over the coming years. So that's, that's going to be another element to watch out for. Uh, 2021, 2022, seeing a lot of investments in upskilling and reskilling initiatives across enterprises and service providers, that's going to provide a fill-up. Having said all of that, let's remember that this is the demand supply gap percentage. Now, the workforce demand for enterprises is still going to grow at 8%. So if I had to drive, draw the overall gap on those base numbers, which is the demand number for IT workforce and the supply number, that's still not going to diverge, right? So in some ways, I think you and I concur. 
Yeah, and I think you know there's no there's no turning back on the demographics uh, and the declines we're seeing there in new workers, but there is a hope of doubling down in India, and I think that is the potential to add new, uh, more an uh, increasing number of uh, larger populations of college graduates from India, and I think the demographics are favorable for that over the next five to ten years. But then even after that, India is going to be challenged as well. Yeah. So uh, I, I talked about the IT talent scramble issue, right? So, but but and and, and it's it's obvious that a large part of the focus of IT workforce leaders is is here and now in terms of how do we uh, tackle with this current spike that we see uh, in in attrition rates, uh, you know, time to hire and so on and so forth. Uh, Rohit, I'm going to call you on this, but fundamentally, we are seeing a few things on a defense side. It, it, some of the levers seem to be compensation, engagement, and morale. Uh, but there are a lot more dimensions that are coming into the play when, when uh, workforce leaders are thinking about acquisition. Yeah, Nishun, there are a lot of things, you know, which companies have done, especially in the last uh, year. Uh, you know, we, we saw companies literally deploy everything, every trick they could. But I'll probably stress on two or three, which I thought were more uh, impactful. If I look at it from a acquisition side first, you know, I think one, even uh, looking for talent remotely, even without having clarity on uh, what their long-term work from home strategy is going to be, companies started kind of, you know, providing a lot of that flexibility and looking for talent everywhere, realizing that uh, some of the COVID related restrictions are here to stay and they don't want to lose on acquisition opportunities in the meanwhile. So they have really gone to different parts of the world, different parts of country to uh, acquire talent uh, very effectively. Second, uh, I really like uh, is the number 18 on your slide here, which is the internal recruitment of critical skills, because often it is about new demand coming in and straight going to HR and new job openings. But uh, even after uh, spending a lot of time more than uh, what is ideal to find that talent, companies realize that talent is not fitting very well. So there is that 60, 70% good fit that they find. Uh, some of the companies realizing that it is easier to fill those jobs internally and find talent for a different set of skills externally, where actually they don't have a lot of challenges. And the success rate, the ease of integration is pretty much the same. So these I've seen are kind of some of the standout measures uh, we have seen uh, organizations take. Uh, generally, you'll see here, uh, there are a lot of things where people are making uh, investments, bonuses, salaries, etc. So companies funded a lot of this uh, because of the savings of uh, other nature coming from the remote working. Uh, the sustainability is not guaranteed. So either companies need to be ready to keep uh, putting in more money, otherwise being more programmatic about it. And we'll talk more about some of those uh, initiatives as we move forward. So guys, let me ask you a question. Which do you think is more important, the playing offense or playing defense here? Uh, I think the winners in, 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 in NBA or any, any, uh, any, any game that we pick have a great defense and a great offense. So you're going to go for, you got to go 50, 50. Rohit, what's your, what's your thought process? Is it 50 -50? I, I agree. It needs to be balanced. Interestingly, we have seen companies, you know, if they fail on defense, still be on offense. What I say is uh, companies are realizing a lot of uh, talent is moving out because of uh, perception of better opportunities or uh, a lot of uh, salary jump, but they are realizing that's not the culture they want to be a part of. They're missing certain elements of their previous jobs. So staying in touch with your best performers is also uh, an important thing. You know, You could kind of be on offense even after you have lost a certain talent pool. All right, I agree. It, it's it's going to be a complex conversation here, and probably not just as simple as uh, putting up a bunch of new, uh, job postings on on job boards. So um, let's let's roll into the the next section where we're actually going to take you step by step in the five success driving actions that we've 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 talked about. We're going to talk about here for the next uh, few minutes. So let's move into number one, which is really establishing not only the offense and defense, but the short term and the long term. Uh, how do you create that fit for purpose IT workforce? So we think it's important to have a structured approach that is 
uh, holistic in nature. Uh, the traditional approach has been kind of looking from the HR perspective, it's been looking at actually item number two, which is the people strategy. How do you go out and attract and retain uh, a team? Uh, we do believe that it, it is much more comprehensive now. Uh, we've got to focus in on the workforce strategy, which includes a sourcing model, location, supply, demand. So yeah, you can't just put out a, a help wanted sign and people will show up at your door. You can need to go find where you need to be recruiting those and the different techniques for recruiting them. And it may be very unconventional compared to the past. And so, uh, you know, taking that holistic approach, but it's also looking at the work itself. So what are you driving in terms of the optimization of that work, uh, you know, the technology to get more out of your existing workforce? And Jamit, we have a, a fourth dimension on the orchestration. You'd like to talk about that one. And I think, I think it's about bringing all of this together. And if you kind of go back to what it is that we are trying to recommend as this step, right? It is about building the right balance between some of the more near term actions and the longer term planning. So if you think about what organizations are doing right now, we're seeing a lot of sourcing model redesign, location model redesign, skills taxonomy, definition, Demand supply planning, that's always been a bit of a hard one for organizations, but the workforce strategy piece, that's the one where we are seeing a lot of long-term planning going in. Ashwin and Rohit spoke about the offense and defense strategies that we're seeing on number two. It is about building this whole piece together and creating that fine balance, which is why we see orchestration being a big component. And that's where the partnership between the business, IT and HR becomes really, really important to drive to the success factors that you really want to get to. So finding that right balance right now, you can't just say, hey, I'm gonna ignore the near term, just, just get our beautiful strategy for the long term, right? It's not gonna work. This is going to be really important in terms of drawing this fine line between the short and the long term to create what we're calling is this fit for purpose IT workforce. So Ashwin, let me ask you a question here. Uh, I know you spend a lot of time on this topic with, with your clients. Um, Skills taxonomy, it used to be, you know, you, you needed network programmer, programmers, you need mainframe, you need a desktop, but I think you're tracking how many skills right now in your skills taxonomy? Uh, a thousand plus. A thousand plus. So you're saying that, you know, you can't just go out and hire IT people. You need to really look across that entire entirety of, uh, of, the, of the spectrum of jobs or, or skills that are required and, and really build a strategy that may be different for uh, different types of different segmentations of that skill base. Yes, Michael, and, and and it's important to keep a regular track of it. We know that the half sky, uh, half life of, of skills uh, are, are are declining very fast, right? So that's one. Second, how those skills come together and make up different roles, right? To deliver uh, services value, and I talked about business context. So how all of that skills kind of roll up, and then and, uh, you know how how roles get defined is another key element, and I will be double clicking on that as well, right? But when Jim had talked about balance, uh, so what we've also been doing is has been putting together a set of initiatives that we have been observing, uh, you know, enterprises taking to to balance that particular act, right? So if we really look at it on the left hand side, these are recognizable. We've talked some of, about some of these uh, in the discussion so far. So across workforce, people, and optimization that that Michael and Jim had just articulated. Uh, there are a set of action items that are being undertaken. The one that I'll definitely highlight on the left side is, is around the workforce optimization bit. So uh, while Rohit kind of presented the set of 20 blocks around acquisition and retention, one another key element that's also coming in is how do you hire and, and, and bring in candidates uh, with the right quality, right? And one of the interesting themes that's, that's cropping up is, uh, and, and one of the challenges in fact is, uh, fraud and impersonation during interviews. So obviously enterprises are trying to make the entire experience seamless by reducing the number of interviews, but then it's, it's impacting quality in certain ways. So there are measures that are being used in terms of technology to try and you know, figure out whether there's plagiarism, copying, more in-depth background checks that are being done. So variety of issues that, that we're already seeing that we have uh, put on the list. The right side is a long-term picture. That's that's where uh, really the, the journey takes a multi-year view. We have talked about some of this, but from a workforce strategy perspective, uh, it's about setting the foundations, right? So thinking about which skills and what volumes, 
what would your business be requiring and so on and so forth and and making those effective build by borrow decisions right that's going to be key and we see a quite a few nuances right so for for instance this has to be built grounds up so the, the numbers around build versus buy are going to be looking very different for infrastructure applications so this can't be a number that can be picked randomly at an it level it has to be built and forecast at grounds up this has to be aligned with various business units uh, who are in play and so on and so forth so it's planning change management everything coming together people strategy will be talking about uh, this around uh, diversity and inclusion i think the final point is around hyper productivity so the cost baseline is going to increase for sure uh, and there's going to be pressures around doing getting more done with less and then that's where fundamentally uh, a lot of productivity programs we anticipate are going to be put in place and need to be put in place in the long term to uh, offset some of the cost increases that that are inevitable Okay, Ash, well, we talked about offense, we talked about defense, we talked about long term, we talked about short term. Let's talk about uh, the channels and uh, different ch different ways of getting there. And uh, Rohit, you were going to bring in some thoughts on different channels of accessing talent. True, uh, Michael and uh, Ashun just talk about build versus buy. I think uh, buying is easy, but uh, you know what is also important right now, companies, uh, both from a short-term and long-term perspective is to make the maximum leverage of their existing talent. I think it's easy to start looking out for new talent, but there is more to be done with what currently is. So both how do you plug uh, attrition? How do you think about productivity? Uh, how do you better manage your internal movements, uh, talent movements? L&D is going to be a big focus. I shouldn't talk about how the half half life of skills is reducing. So with that happening and a lot of new skills, they're not fundamentally new. They're an extension of a lot of current skills as well. So companies need to kind of uh, focus on a lot of uh, aspects of management of their current workforce. Looking beyond that, of course, you know, to think about better talent acquisition approach. And I think from a long term perspective, on this one aspect, at least uh, what COVID has brought to uh, you know life is kind of a blessing, which is the reality that teams can you know work, collaborate, and be very productive in a very uh, distributed model as well. Uh, so looking at uh, acquisition from different uh, locations, remote models, uh, different hub and spoke models, looking at a mix of uh, permanent workforce and gig contingent impact workers. Uh, I think a lot of that is going to be very important, particularly looking at either locations like Africa or uh, segments like impact workers, which are currently underutilized, but potentially will play an important role in plugging some of the gaps going forward. Lastly, uh, all companies deal with this at an individual level, but there is the genuine white space for uh, industry to kind of come together, collaborate and uh, improve the uh, project readiness or the overall uh, you know skill set uh, in uh, in the in the workforce this is happening across many locations for example in india the government is starting many programs but but this is still kind of you know just touching the surface a lot needs to happen uh, there jimit I, I know you have some thoughts on this i'd say i'd say that what we what we are effectively laying out across all of this is that you know the theme here is it's not just about surviving the next 12 18 months the theme is to make sure we are building a future fit workforce that's sustainable for the next three five ten years and this is where a lot of the themes you're going to see us talk about are going to have a short-term implication and the long-term implication Rohit what I liked about what you had here is the leverage of existing talent the approaches to talent acquisition help create some short-term fixes. The ecosystem, investing in that ecosystem is what's really going to create the human capital requirements that Ashwin spoke about. And this is where working with consortia, working with academia, working with, with other industry bodies to create what you call is this project ready talent is going to be one of the key success factors uh, it's a channel that some of the larger organizations or big tech companies are doing. I would say that that the traditional CIO shops are not embracing this channel. So I think going after defining your own ecosystem in your college town closest to your headquarters is going to be a key requirement 
for the future. Yeah, and Javid, that's an interesting point that you make, right? Uh, making use of all available resources, being innovative, being creative. And one of the aspects around that is, uh, and, 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 and the theme has been spoken about a lot, uh, which is around diversity and an inclusion. Our fundamental observation is that enterprises are simply not doing enough on, on, on this particular aspect. Uh, and there are multiple dimensions to it, right? So when we think of diversity and inclusion, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously gender and ethical, uh, and, and, and uh, gender uh, uh, and, and ethnic minorities. What we're seeing is in many cases, this, this is being done only as, as a lip service rather than being truly intentional, right? And in best-in-class enterprises, what we see is they, they are being programmatic about it. There are targets that are being set across different IT functions, across different uh, roles and experience levels. So there's two purpose that's being put around it. It's, it's not being done just to build brands and, 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 and try to put out messages in the market, but it's been seen as a valuable lever to really leverage uh, the next generation of workforce, right? So that's, that's one aspect. If you think of inclusivity, one of the key things that's becoming important is how do we think of inclusivity from a remote versus an office going workforce, right? We believe that, and then we're seeing that a lot of unconscious biases are starting to crop up, right? Uh, remote workforce is feeling left out at this point in time. How do you think about their career progression? How do you think about evaluating their performance versus people who are there uh, in, in, in offices present, ready to collaborate, et cetera, and so on and so forth. The one final aspect that we are really passionate about that we see on this page is neurodiversity. We are really, really happy that this is finally getting the uh, attention that it deserves. And what we're seeing is in the use cases and the examples where enterprises have been successful, uh, there is a fundamental skill set that neurodiverse workforce brings to the table, right? We can see those on the left, they're, they're pretty well understood now. But to start on the journey, there are already examples that, that enterprises can start thinking of, right? So if you think of one of the examples of your security operations, uh, it, it requires you know, parsing through a lot of logs. It, it requires people to observe anomalies, right? And then and the workforce that we're talking about from a new neurodiverse standpoint are, are really, really adapted at doing this, right? You think of ML processes, uh, building data models. So there are a variety of use cases where fundamentally they can become, uh, they can be plugged in. Obviously, there are considerations. Recruitment teams need to be sensitized in terms of how, how they manage hiring processes with, with such workforce. You need to train a lot of uh, people internally to drive career progression, training, specific onboarding programs, and so on and so forth. It is going to be effort, but it's going to be more than worthwhile. And as I said earlier, this is not about just building brands, but truly a viable lever to bridge the long-term skills gap that we're going to see. All right, so Ashwin, I know you got a lot of uh, detail behind a lot of this stuff, and uh, we, we've done actually done a whole entire webinars on just this one topic. Um, and so what we're going to do is make a little offer here for those folks that are on the buy side, the enterprises. If you're interested in digging deeper, um, if you really want to check out and see whether Ashwin and Rohat have a thousand different skills in their inventory of, uh, of roles that are out for the IT area. Uh, we're going to give you the opportunity to, to click uh, click the box there and uh, pick the one that you're interested in. I believe there's opportunity to make two different choices, and uh, Ashwin and, and Jamit and uh, Rohit can get back to you as it applies, and we can drill down with you and 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 talk about how this these conversations apply to your specific situation. So I'm going to leave that open here for another five seconds. If these are interesting topics to you, uh, feel free to to to. to uh, to click the button and we'll reach out back out to you. Okay, uh, we'll close that off. Let's move into our next segment here. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, looking inward, uh, owning the keys to your kingdom through the robust internal build here. So Jamit and Ashwin, you're gonna tackle this one, uh, specifically looking at some of those dimensions. Yep, <clears throat> and, and I think that that build versus buy debate has been going on, right? You go back to the thesis we had earlier about here's a systems of growth mindset. And therefore, if you put that together, the direction that a lot of our clients 
are moving into is how do we rebalance the workforce so that we have greater dependency on resources that are our own? We augment them for sure with uh, external stuff through outsource providers, contingent labor, but the fundamental design principle seems to be aligning towards, you know, we want to be in control of our technology destiny. Therefore, we want to be having more of these people within our ecosystem. Let's also be mindful of the reality here for a second, which is labor is in short supply. So you are going to be in a situation where A, you'll always be catching up and you'll have to keep relying on the third parties for the near to for the near term. But what's really helping some of the companies stand out is to create an effective and scale scaling program. So what were, what were some of the key things that we thought are important on this is make sure you have a dedicated team that's focused on scaling, which has buy-in from very senior leadership. Otherwise, this falls flat. Uh, this needs to be funded appropriately, and the funding for this will have to come with the business, right? It's not for the business, but it's with the business. Uh, the skills inventory is very important, so you need to make sure that you have a standardized skills taxonomy, skills inventory, and Ashwin and Rohit are going to talk a bit about how you really enable those to create the right skills passports and skills journeys. But that robust foundation becomes key. Otherwise, it's a, it's a moving target. And then how you really drive scale and success for this. So the first few were more about the effective programs, but how you really drive scale in this is by incentivizing employees with the right career development choices. This has to impact their performance uh, this has to impact their career paths. This has to impact their mobility. So a voluntary skills program is unlikely to succeed. And then finally, it has to be enabled through the right set of enterprise-grade technology and enterprise ecosystem, right? So those are the five key ways in which we are seeing organizers, organizations really create the right scaling, uh, the right skilling program uh, to succeed. Yeah, and uh, you know some some few examples. So if we just stay on the previous slide, actually, right? So one of the key aspects becomes how do you measure and how do you ensure that the value that you seek from these skilling uh, journeys and investments do take place. So if I had to take one example over here, the the career paths one where you're talking about internal mobility, what we are seeing practically happen on the ground is uh, there's a lot of resistance from managers. In, in letting go of, of some of the people that I've groomed when, when, when opportunities are sought for moving to different roles, to different teams, uh, to, 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 to expand horizons, right? So incentivizing uh, career development, not just for the employee whom you want to reskill, but the broader team and ecosystem around it, right? How do you incentivize managers to let go of people and then give them the comfort that they, they, they're going to have, get the necessary replacements? That's going to be important. Rose, I know that you you also mentioned you have seen another couple of practical examples that you wanted to share. Yeah, I, I think between you and Jim, you covered some of those examples. Uh, only thing I'll add here is that if we take 2021 as a test case, uh, you know, not that anybody was immune to the talent scramble situation, but companies who were programmatically focusing on the uh, taxonomy the skills inventory and the programmatic uh, you know uh, movements of talent internally they were relatively you know uh, kind of protected against some of that and they were able to solve problems with relative ease as compared to others we did a very extensive study to identify how do you actually go about it what are the steps you can take to structure a, a effective skilling strategy so the uh, so study is referenced here but do reach out to us in case you know uh, somebody wants to uh, get into more details of that. Yeah. And Rohit, you talked about the foundations, right? And, and it's going to be very important. And then one of the key observations that we have is it's going to be very important for enterprises to design and carve those roles out very well and then have clarity around it, right? So we have been looking at a number of different IT roles that are upcoming and emerging. What you see on the screen is, is one of the most uh, sought, sought after in some ways a, a unicorn in the market, which is site reliability engineers. 
the point that we are trying to drive home is if you think of the skills that are required uh, and it's evidently cross-functional, uh, it's, it's important to have this uh, inventory and passport well-defined at the end of the day, right? That's got, that's going to be step one. Now, it's very obvious that it's, it's going to be hard to find someone who has all these skills in the market, but then this becomes a good uh, avenue to think of what are some of the adjacent goals that can be considered. So as an example, what we have seen in certain cases is DevOps engineers have been uh, thought of as a, as a suitable proxy in some ways and are being brought in into organizations. A, a quick reskilling happens and they are fit enough to act as SREs. Right? So that's number one. The second angle when you think of developing these roles is it's, it's not just about the definition in terms of the skill set, but it's also about how you absorb them and give them the environment to do what they're supposed to do. As an example, what we see in many cases is when we think of SREs, they end up spending around 80 to 90% or, uh, of, of their time in operations, whereas they are supposed to engineer, right? And then that's where the focus should be going on. So we see an example of a cap being put on SRE saying that they should not be doing more than 50% operations. So there are a lot of considerations, both from a taxonomy perspective and qualitative, which, which need to be kept in mind so that you, you are able to attract and develop the right talent who are going to give you the right value. So that's one. The second theme that we're gonna talk about in the next slide is how do you plan for that skilling journey, right? So the question that gets asked is, hey, which are the exact roles that we should be looking at to, to in fact start those skilling journeys, right? So in some ways, this is where a proper understanding of the existing roles within the organization becomes important. Uh, so for instance, when you're thinking of full stack developers, if, if, if you look at your organization in terms of high volume, low demand uh, roles, those kind of become the ones which are commoditized and, and are ripe for uh, upscaling journeys, right? So when you start looking at it from that perspective, there are multiple starting points that you can start considering uh, and you start then thinking about what the journey looks like. What are the additional skill set that need to be brought in? Uh, what are the kind of training courses that, that need to be uh, you know, re really put forth to, to really uh, develop these uh, roles and the, that, that you need? What this also helps you think about is you can start opening up different role options. So for as a software developer, the options can be that person can become a full stack developer they can become SREs, they can continue to scale and become project managers. So you're providing that autonomy for, for your employees to choose which role they want to pick based on their interests, rather than just sandboxing them into very specific hierarchical uh, designs that you have within your organization. So there are a lot of conversations and, and, and thought processes that, that go underneath this. We have done a lot of work around this and we'd be happy to uh, share our knowledge outside of this webinar as well. So yeah, Michael, back to you. Yeah, Ashwin. I mean, it looks pretty complex. I'm, I'm guessing you can't just hire these folks right off the right out of college. Uh, yeah. Good luck doing that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure, sure that's going to work. You're going to have to get a little. They're going to get a real a little bit of real life experience to really pull this together. I think the trick to do that is in a how do you compress all that experience that you're suggesting there in a reasonably compact uh, uh, time frame so to to scale to allow it to scale. All right, so Jamit, I'm gonna I want to hit you with one here. Um, you know, hiring from your neighbors one good solution. That's the the offense, uh, and and you're gonna probably bust your budget doing that. Uh, going out there and changing up your recruiting and, and processes and and also lots of other things that have been talked about today. But one of the other things to do is make the existing workforce more productive. And um, you know, I think that's we're gonna see that across all jo jobs, not just in IT. But how do we make the existing uh, organizations, whether you're in retail, whether you're in trucking, or whether you're in manufacturing, how do you make the existing workforce more productive? How does that apply here? Yeah, and I and I think it's an important one, right? Because we've had, if we if we move to the next page, right? Um, there's been a bit of a iceberg effect that's that's gone on, and if you think about the first year, we're almost two years into this now, right? If you think about the first year, the initial phases were, hey, work from home productivity is awesome. Right, we're saving a bunch of commute time. Operations haven't been impacted. Uh, a large portion of that was because people were saving that commute time and putting it right back into the work, given the you know lockdowns and 
inability to do something. So what we saw was a high degree of productivity, uh, which I'm calling is a bit of a false positive. And this is the one controversy in some ways that we need to really watch out because if you go back to classical thinking around technology productivity, it favored co-location, it favored small teams, right? So we joked about the whole two pizza box, Nerf ball strategy. Feed team should be no longer than what can be fed with two pizza boxes and you can hit each other with a Nerf ball. That was considered the pinnacle of productivity. You can't have that anymore, right? Um, I end up eating both the pizzas myself, which isn't really good for my chair, but that's okay. Uh, so what's, what's happening right now is that quality is deteriorating. We are not really getting a lot of the right thought diversity because there's only so much thought diversity you can curate through structured team calls. Output velocity is going down, errors are going up. So we see an environment where serious issues are building below the surface, right? Which is why, and, and we kind of come to the next one shortly, you know, what does that really mean to the future of the office, right? And we have a point of view on that, but truly I think productivity is going to be an enabler. Uh, it is something that companies need to watch out for in our framework. It was in that third third element of technology. Right now, I'd say it's something that people need to develop very intentional strategies about. Declaring one way or another is going to be very dangerous. Declaring that, hey, work from home productivity is awesome is not the right answer. Declaring work from home productivity is lower is also not the right answer. So we really need to be watching the space for more and then it's important to dive deeper to demystify these false positives of productivity we saw early on. Yeah, and Jamet, there's a lot of dimensions there to that iceberg. Um, you know, the, the easiest way is to focus in on the, you know, the commute time and the work from home hours perspective. But I think it really goes deeper in terms of uh, almost that mindset and, and the teaming part of the, of the conversation. How do you create yeah. that energy so everybody's participating? Um, and then there's a technology enablement that may or may not help things. I think a lot of people are, I think about, well, I'll just in, in, implement more technology and that solves the problem, but I'm not sure it does. No, no, in this case, in this case on the IT side, probably doesn't. Yeah. So, I mean, it really is a, it, it, it is very cultural or, or, or team orientated. And especially when you start thinking about what's going to happen with the, the college students that we're hiring, you know, hiring today, uh, they may not have that five or 10 years or 20 years of background with it, with a work group. And so they're yeah. coming in completely cold. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's, that's, that's what we are now starting to see uh, issues around. And that's, that's causing people to re-examine how they think of offices, how they think of onboarding, how they think of culture. So yes, I think productivity is going to be an important one. Let's not, let's not make snap decisions, but we need to solve for this as an industry. Yeah. And talking about solving, Jim, Michael, if you look at the size of the iceberg over there, it's not something that can be chipped away in a day. It's again going to be a journey. Right? Yep. And that's what we want to talk about on the next slide. Uh, it's it's uh, at a fundamental level, it, it's a cultural shift, right? There needs to be acknowledgement across the board that this is required, that needs to be driven uh, across the organization. But it can't be just pushed down as a mandate, right? Telling people who are already working in remote and very different circumstances that, hey, they need to do more. This is not, this is absolutely the wrong way to go about it. It requires more structured thinking. And then we believe there are a couple of elements to this. One, the first and foremost thing is to try and understand what we really need to improve, right, from a productivity perspective. So, I mean, we have seen these cases, right? So productivity is, is, is kind of equated with, hey, let's try and see how our service desk team increases the average handling time. Whereas the if you really think about it, the true objective function is how do we want to make the end user experience better, right? So it's not about how you reduce the time that the service desk agent is on the call, but maybe the better question is whether the right service agent is helping out. Are you using knowledge articles to try and identify which service agent is best suited for a particular ticket, right? Through data and analytics. You think of marketing automation, right? You want to drive your customer sales acquisition. It's not about the steps of automation that's built within the marketing. The end goal is to increase the number of leads. So how is automation analytics help you drive that personalization? So having that anchor is very important and you need to work down. That's number one. And the second aspect is that 
people who are in the trenches are the ones who are going to have the real answers, right? So it's not about senior leaders driving this mandate down. You need to give autonomy to the individual teams to try and understand where the problem lies. You need to give, you need to make them come up with the solutions, right? Whether it's technology infrastructure, that's the issue, whether they're not able to collaborate, whether they don't have the training, they don't have inputs from business. So it, it has to be thought of a proper structure. Teams need to be brought on board. They need to be given autonomy. So consequently, there are a lot of requisites for success, right? You need people who know how to do this. It's, it's not just about technology changes like Michael and uh, Jimmy talked about. It's about change management in some ways. So that's one. You need to find champions uh, within the organization, right? Not everyone is going to come on board. There are people who want to, who are going to be happy with status quo. So you need to energize, you need to be setting targets and, and you need to identify change agents. And then obviously uh, it's about learning from the market, right? You don't want to set very unrealistic targets. You want to make them practical. So it's going to be a journey. It's going to be a design that's that's going to be have a lot of elements and components. Uh, and then that's something that we thought we, we, we make enterprises think through. Yeah, and Ashwin, I really think that team culture is going to be absolutely critical here. We're going to, and, and they're going to face so many different challenges to, to making that culture work. I mean, with all the difference of, as we move into the next topic, really that ambiguity, uh, it's not going to go away. Um, you know, I mean, you're going to have, we, in the face of rising attrition, uh, evolving technologies, different uh, cultural things out in the work environment and in, in the home environment. Uh, let's talk about the, uh, the hows of work, of the ways of working, of the new ways of working, Jamit. Yeah, and, and this is where, you know, um, I'm, I'm looking for analogies and I'm going to end up with a very bad one, I guess. But pre-pandemic, it was all all on site, right? Uh, during the pandemic, everyone was at home. I'm going to use a compute analogy here. So we were all private or we were on-prem. We all moved to the public cloud. Now... I want to call it hybrid for the future, but actually it's not hybrid. It is multi-cloud, right? And effectively what you're going to have is what I call is the Santa Claus strategy for the future, which is you're either at home or you're in the office and it could be ho, 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 home, office, home, office. Sorry, I told you guys there would be a bad joke in here, but I do see that that's the future working model where companies that declare you're always at home or you're always in the office are going to struggle with talent attraction and retention. You will need to find your happy medium, right? People are talking about work from anywhere. I don't think that in technology, you can really enable that with the right infrastructure. Sounds cute, but I don't think work from anywhere in technology is going to be a great idea. But the ability to flex between the individual's home and the individual's office is going to be a big aspect of uh, the new normal that we would expect, right? 100% work from office environment, while it might seem to be appropriate for the culture and productivity conversation we are having, is going to exclude a large portion of the talent base. So we are not recommending any of that to our clients as well. So that balance is going to be important. Our research suggests that 70% of teams will operate in this Santa Claus model, but we'll, we'll know more later. Rohit, you want to yeah, right. walk through some of the, the uh, ways in which people are thinking about these solves? Yeah, exactly. And uh, we have more questions than answers. We have been studying this extensively, not just during the pandemic, but also global organizations who have tried to scale work from home successfully in a normal world pre-pandemic as well. So what we really need is organizations to be thinking about it from many different perspectives. This is not just about giving people an option that rather than working from home, okay, two days they can work from office, team X and Y can work from home permanently because they are showing more inclination towards it. Uh, it's not as simple as that. Organizations need to think about their leadership and governance model changes. The change needs to start right from the top on how do you think about you know, the productivity, like Ashwin talked about in productivity perspective, what is your end objective? And hence, what are the SLAs you use? So I think a lot of that is going to need rethinking and ensuring that teams are managed and the right kind of governance is there. Uh, people need to understand that they will have unconscious bias against workers they can see, workers they can't see. 
uh, we talked about improving productivity. What about preserving productivity and productivity? Uh, you know, uh, at a cultural as a culture of the organization at an individual level. So a lot of things that need rethinking. We spoke many times about office and the purpose of office. I think that requires a fundamental rethink, and we see many organizations creating cross-functional project teams to you know really try and get to the bottom of it. But exactly why do you need people to come to office? What is the basic minimum requirement? What are the additional requirement? What are the scenarios? It all needs to come together. The meaning of safety is changing. The meaning of uh, office, you know, boundaries are changing. So you are providing employee safety both at home and in office. And also it is in uh, safety both in a physical manner and a mental uh, manner as well as the inf information security. So I think a lot of these things uh, will need to be uh, accounted for. A uh, fair bit of investments to be made into technology. Right now, uh, technology is looked at as a tool to collaborate, improve productivity. But what about uh, you know a technology to kind of make life of your employees and your clients easier? Uh, you know the way you think about business, applying similar lens on your technology teams and the way they operate as well. Uh, we have seen. Uh, some successful organizations think about the technology problems as as you know at the same level as they think about their strategy towards this because that has a big uh, big role to play. Lastly, of course, a lot of talent model changes. You know, this uh, people uh, were forced into work from home, then they kind of you know got used to it. But as people think about futures, uh, preferences can also change, comfort levels can also change. The same employees in different stages of life might want different things. So a lot of those uh, need to reflect into your talent model strategy. Uh, how do you ensure talent growth? How do you kind of avoid uh, isolation? Uh, and then how do you kind of you know not invade their privacy while trying to govern them? So we are again uh, investigating this in a in a lot of depth and uh, happy to talk more about it uh, to to answer specific questions. All right. Rohit, thank you for that. Um, let's summarize here what we've heard. Uh, overall, I would say that if you look at the businesses in general, uh, business demand is up. So the, the, the overall uh, revenues and, and demand for talent across the board, regardless of whether they're IT or not IT, is up in, in the highest it's been in years. Uh, the population demographics are down. So we're going to see fewer workers coming into the talent pool uh, across the world. Uh, companies are going to need to play offense and defense as they try to solve these problems. It's going to be both a long-term strategy and a short-term strategy, and then it's going to be multidimensional. So as we summarize on here, that short and long-term here for number one. Uh, the second is about creating parallel channels. More is better. And then looking inward, so understanding that it, it, it sounds easy to go out and hire somebody else's from across the street, somebody else's talent from across the street, but that has its own implications uh, uh, from a uh, building of team and culture and all that good, all that good stuff. Yeah. Uh, productivity is going to become front and center. It's going to be key mandate. It's time organizations double down, but it's not just about wielding the stick. It requires a program, programmatic approach. And as both Jamit and I have been talking about, embrace that ambiguity. It's not going away. Um, if there was an easy answer, we would have it on the next slide and we'd just we'd tell you what to do. But uh, the reality is it's complex. It's going to take a multi-pronged strategy to solve. And so with that, uh, we wanted to get uh, we usually do quick polls at the very beginning. We wanted to hear, we're saving this one kind of toward the end. We want to get your input in terms of which of these uh, strategies that we put out here you, you think are the most effective for your organization and that you're thinking about uh, focusing in on 2022. So summarizing those five here and these uh, quick poll answers, pick, uh, you can do, you can actually pick two of these. We'd prefer, uh, not don't pick them all, but pick two that you think are most important for your organization. And we'll leave this open here for uh, eight, eight seconds more. Okay, the answers are coming in. All right, we got two leaders in the pack right now. Leave it open for another five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's close it out here. All right, so the, not, there's actually uh, co-leaders here establishing the right balance between short-term and long-term fix, uh, fixes, and then that internal kind of inward-looking uh, aspect of this. Uh, Jimit, what do you see? And I think I think it makes sense, right? Because both of these are positioning you for success over the next 12, 18 months. And I think as companies are recognizing that it's getting harder to 
to um, get talent externally, the internal build also has this additional advantage of playing defense and retaining people. So you don't have to bring so many more in, right? So I see, I, I, I definitely see that great correlation. I do think there's a desire, if you look at the third one, to execute on how the new ways of working play out. So that being uh, number three on the list doesn't surprise me either because that's the here and now. And I think companies were already grappling with how and when you bring people back when Omicron hit. So I think what, what we are seeing in terms of the priorities and the way they are sorted is a reflection of where 12, 18 months create the most impact. Okay, Jamit, we have some questions here, uh, Rohit and Ashwin. I know we have a lot of, we do not have a lot of time. Um, there are some questions around specific IT services vendors. And rather than try to, to name off a specific, uh, if we can try to answer those questions offline. So uh, if you guys will follow up with um, those specific ones. Um, let me pick one here that kind of summarizes uh, this whole thing. Is, is there a really a talent shortage or are we focusing too much on the war part instead of the retention and expectation setting? Uh, anybody got quick thoughts on that? Is there, is there, is the I, I almost want to say the talent war is over. <laughs> the employees won. <laughs> talent <laughs> won. I think at the end of the day, this is demand supply. Right, And if you look at the way demand is going, if you see the way at which we are creating supply, there is a talent shortage. Ashwin had that slide up mathematically, which shows out that the gap between demand and supply is structural, right? And it is because companies are investing in systems of growth. Everyone wants to make sure that technology fuels growth. So we believe that there is a very real talent shortage. And we also believe that the talent shortage in technology is not going away anytime soon. So to reiterate our overall webinar series, it's it's not a war, it's it's the new reality. Yes, exactly. Couldn't have said it better. All right, here's one more I'll pick on. This should be a quick one. It says many Indian delivery centers are seeing significantly higher attrition than 10% with no signs of slowing down. What are the lessons learned to help stem the tide beyond, beyond just adjusting salaries? So let me start out. If you're only seeing a 10% attrition, I mean, I know you and I have had slides and Ashwin, we've had slides at what, plus 30% on the attrition right now. So yeah. If, you go, if, if you're getting 10%, that's, that's got to be almost like best in class. I mean, yeah, I mean, anything, anything. So 10% is best in class. I think the point which might be confusing is we've been saying that attrition's gone up by at least 10 points. So if your attrition was 15%, it's gone up by 10 points, right? So uh, that's, that's one of the things that's going to be important to watch out for. And it's not just happening in India, actually. We also see this as being a very global phenomena, right? Obviously, in India, you see more mobility, so the numbers are higher there, but we're seeing the same thing in China, Philippines, the US, UK. So it's it's a fairly global global piece. Um, in terms of what you do, I think, and that's, that's where the whole 20 strategies, offense and defense that we had in one of the pages becomes really important. Salaries is probably one of the several ways what we are finding is that this whole, especially as you look at some of the, the newer workers in, jo in, in entering the workforce, it's not just about the compensation, it is about purpose. It is about the, the employee value proposition. So taking a singular salary only approach is unlikely to succeed. All right, uh, real quick, Ashwin, how do you help your clients in 30 seconds or less? Yeah, we are here to help. We saw that there are different IT workforce priorities. We, we cover all of them. Uh, a lot of data insights that, that we have built over the years. Uh, and we offer this in a very, very customized fashion to help solve specific problems, coach uh, and uh, IT workforce leaders, uh, show them the big picture, help them chart the journey. And we do this in a variety of different engagement models and in structures. We'll be more than happy to discuss this offline. Okay. And, and like I said, there were pages of questions here. We're not going to, we, we're not able to get to, we tried to incorporate some of them into our talk track, but um, so uh, if you want to reach out to any of us, please feel free to do so. We're all available. Our emails or LinkedIn is another good way to reach us. We do have a, uh, this is part of a series of five success driving actions for 2022. So there's a, a series of these coming up here. I believe there's a link in the chat room that you can uh, see some of the other uh, registrations for these these um, these upcoming uh, webinars. And with that, I want to thank uh, Ashwin, Rohit, and Jamit for their time today. And everybody have a great day. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.